So I have never been a tree hugger. I've never been on a mission to save the planet. But over the years, I have become an accidental philanthropist. Today, I will share seven stories, four from the past because they shaped me, and three in the future because they inspire me. Past event number one. When I was in high school graduation, I blew all my savings. And counterintuitively, that turned out to be a lot less fun than it sounds. But it turned out to be a pretty bad experience, actually. But it was one of the most valuable learning experiences of my life. In many ways, this splurge was completely out of character for me, because I was the guy that was saving money. People came to me to borrow money when they were short. But I was thinking, you only live once and for high school graduation, why not do it? So I went to town, had the most epic celebration ever. But the next summer, I was slapped in the face, because my plan had been to get a job that next summer. My cousin had promised a really well-paid job in Oslo, the capital of Norway. And I had calculated that what I would be making in that job would more than compensate for my investment in my celebration. <laughs> but my cousin did not come through with his promise. So here I was in Oslo, in this big city. I didn't know anyone. It was miserable. I didn't have a proper job, and the odd jobs I had was cleaning dirty staircases, of making chew gum out of dirty carpets, and I was not able to sustain myself. I tried to go down to the pier to get day jobs, but day jobs are typically lifting stuff. And when people saw me, this puny little guy, I was never uh, picked. So one day, I was walking home, really miserable. I'd been waiting for hours in vain down by the pier. I told myself, whatever I do, I need to make sure I get the proper education. I need to make sure I get a proper job that I get well paid, because this was a life I didn't want to have. So when I came home that uh, afternoon, I called the unemployment office. I called them, and I asked them a simple question. So, what's well paid these days? And a friendly person on the other end of the line would say, oh, let me see. She was scrolling through the job openings, and she said, electrical engineers, they're in short supply, and the money is really good. And I said, thank you. Thank you so much. And then I hung up. And that is how I became an accidental electrical engineer. <laughs> Pass event number two, I discovered a world of perfection. So when I come to engineering school, I discovered I was a shit electrical engineer. Everyone around me, they had been opening radios and TV since they were three years old. They were amazing. They loved electronics. Me? I was really not there for that reason. In particular, I hated the labs. Nothing in the labs really worked. It was awful. But what I did, I found refuge in a computer that I bought, because I ended up buying this amazing piece of machinery. It was a tower case. 386, 25 megahertz uh, processor, 47 megabyte hard drive, and one megabyte RAM. You're laughing at this right now because your computer is a thousand times faster. But back then, it was actually one of the fastest computers in the southern part of Norway. Within this computer, I found a world of perfection. I found a world where I could be an architect, an engineer, and build pretty much anything I wanted. And that was a very formative experience for me. I didn't understand it at the time, but the journey I did in this virtual world will later actually shape my life trajectory. My first job after college moved me to pass event number three. My first job was an, a research scientist in artificial intelligence, and I loved to dig deep and get a sense of mastery for the particular topic. After work, I was often in the lab, playing around with new technologies. And in particular, I loved the internet. I loved the World Wide Web. I found it fascinating that anyone with a click of a button could publish a document that was instantly available for everyone else in the world. And one evening, I downloaded something called Java applets, and I became really moved. 
I had downloaded the specification in SCAP 2.0 and discovered that Java applets were small pieces of software that we downloaded and executed in a browser. And in Netscape 2.0, anyone could build Java applets and publish that with the same ease to publish web pages. That completely blew my mind. I realized the world was going to change. I realized the world was going to change the way we worked, the way we talked, and the way we lived our lives. So that night when I walked home, I remember I felt very privileged. I was thinking it was an incredibly lucky, fortunate circumstance that I was living right at this moment when a thing as powerful as the internet was going to be unleashed on the world. So the next morning, I quit my job uh, to start a company. And not because I have a business idea, but I had this burning passion to be part of this thing called the internet. And I realized the most uh, effective way for doing that would be start an internet company. And that is how I accidentally became an entrepreneur. Past event number four. I started a school for software entrepreneurs in Africa. So being an entrepreneur, I found to be a very fulfilling experience. You start with an idea, you recruit an amazing team, and then you work your butt off. And the camaraderie that you create, working really hard in close-knit teams on a mission to conquer the world, is truly special. When I was chasing down the rabbit hole on my fourth startup, it was again a very fulfilling experience. It was my most ambitious project at the time. I was surrounded by people that was the most amazing I ever worked with, and we were about to create a globally successful business. But for some reason, it didn't feel enough. It not that I was unhappy, but for some reason there was a small voice inside of me that was questioning whether all this hard work was worth it. I observed myself pouring my heart, pouring my heart and soul and everything into my work. I observed myself celebrating with my team members how we won clients and how we entered a new country. Yet, the question that nagged me was the following. For all our accomplishments, what good do we really do? For all our successes, are we really making an impact, a difference? And then I started to think about, how can I make an impact? How can I make a difference? And, you know, I never felt very comfortable making the world a better place. To me, that sounds a little bit too pretentious. But then again, I would find it very rewarding if somehow I could find a way where my work could directly impact other people's life positively. And I started to think how rewarding it was for me when I learned how to code. And I remembered how fulfilling it was for me the first time I started a company. And that's when I realized, maybe if I want to make an impact, the most impact I could create was focusing on my core expertise. And I was a startup guy. I was in the software space. That's really where I should put my effort. The world is full of good causes, but if I was going to try to clean the ocean or try to fight global warming, I would be completely out of my depth, and probably very miserable. And that's when I started to dream about starting a school for software entrepreneurs in sub-Sahara Africa. Some people have questioned me about this Africa thing. So, so why Africa? I mean, you were born in Korea, and you were raised in Norway. Why none of those places? But none of those places did really inspire me, because Korea has a lot of investment, and Norway is one of the richest countries in the world. Africa, on the other hand, seemed like it would be a place where I could be making more of an impact. And here I like to pause and say, I am not an expert on Africa. I have never been, may never be, and before I even thought about this, I'd never been to Africa. But I chose Africa because I was fascinated by the large population in Africa, and it was growing very fast. It was a population of more than a billion people. And imagine the kind of talent there is in a population of a billion people. And that was a very encouraging contrast to all the kind of things, depressing things that you read about in Africa. Malnutrition, war, 
corruption, Nigerian letters, unemployment. <laughs> the list goes on and on, right? But I was thinking, if you could train that talent, that talent could develop software, that talent could develop companies and create jobs and wealth and impact the world positively. So I decided that the best way for me to do this was maybe doing this later, later in life when I had the time. But then one friend of mine pushed me very hard and he said, you cannot take it for granted. You have to do it now. Tomorrow you could be hit by a truck and then it's all over. And that made me pause. And I started to realize, well, actually when I, if I did become old, maybe I would be tired then. Maybe I didn't have the fire in the belly anymore. So for that reason, I decided I had to do it now. I had to do it now before it was too late. And then I realized the best way to keep me accountable would be to announce it. If I announce it publicly, I had to make it. So January 2007, in our company event, where we brought all our employees, where we review the last year's performance and set the objective for next year, I announced that we would set up a school in sub-Saharan Africa within one year. It would be a school where we train local African talent, recently graduate. We teach them how to code, we teach them business model, we teach them go-to-market strategies. The final examination will be an investment pitch. And the best of the graduates will receive funding to start their own company. Before I walked on stage and made that announcement, I was actually a little nervous because I was wondering if people maybe thought I completely lost it. <laughs> but the reception by my employees were extremely heartwarming. Everyone loved it. Some people even came forward and pleaded to be part of the project. So I put together a team of three people, three ambitious, hardworking people that did a lot of desk research. And then we shorted this a number of companies and bought tickets. And for the first time, I ended up in Africa. So we travel around in Africa on a fact-finding mission. And after more than 200 interviews, very interviews, NGOs, universities, entrepreneurs, and prospective students, we chose Ghana. We had traveled to Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Ghana. But Ghana was the one place that gave us the most comfort. It was peaceful. It was safe a tradition for education. A number of African state leaders was uh, trained and developed in uh, Ghana. It was also English-speaking, and had direct flights to London, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, and New York. And that was really valuable for us, because a lot of the uh, faculty would fly in and support the program that way. And then, February 2008, we proudly cut the ribbon, and proudly opened Meltwater Entrepreneurial School of Technology. Missed for short, and then we're off to the races. And that is how I accidentally started a school for software entrepreneurs in Africa. Now, I would like to move to future events. And the first future event is our first startup is acquired for $10 million. Every year, we graduate 60 entrepreneurs, and they, all of them have fascinating stories of how they start a company or how they are trying to take on the world. Today, I will share three of those stories. One of our first companies was Seiya. They were known as the WhatsApp for Africa. Seiya was the first African tech startup that was admitted into TechCrunch tech Disrupt in San Francisco, arguably the most prestigious pitching competition in the world. Seiya was founded by two local Ghanaians, Robert and Badu. They had never had a password before, boarding a plane to San Francisco. And they were dropped in the middle of the madness of Silicon Valley. And here you see Robert on stage, pitching for funding in front of 1,000 people in competition in some of the most promising tech startups in Silicon Valley. And he's sharing the stage with the CEO of Yahoo, Marisa Mayer, and other Silicon Valley dignitaries. Robert was killing it. He went all the way to the top five, Seiya raised international capital and was later acquired by an axle based company. Seiya's exit was a modest exit. And, but 
what they did prove was that the Guinean software company can go up against anyone, anywhere. Also, Silicon Valley. Kudobus was founded by David, Kenna, and Lovell. Kudobus had created a software that today powers more than 10,000 online merchants globally. And the funny thing is that these founders never bought anything online themselves before starting this company <laughs> because they didn't have credit cards. But they were admitted into the prestigious 500 Startups Accelerator in Silicon Valley. And when you do that, you really do it for funding. But when they finished this program, they didn't want to raise funding because they were profitable. They were making money, good money every month. They went to Silicon Valley to learn how to scale and to become big. Kudobus is today an organization approaching 40 people in Ghana. They have recently expanded to India, and they are currently contemplating setting up an office in San Francisco. I'm sure that you will see a lot more from them going forward. Tris is an all-girl team that recently graduated from the program in June 2016. Esther, Cassandra, and Priscilla found through research an underserved global niche market of $500 billion, namely hair for black ladies. The reception of the product has been amazing. Even before they graduated, they were featured in media all over Africa. They were just recently admitted into the legendary Y Combinator program in Silicon Valley. The next six months, they are going to be in Silicon Valley and hammer out a global role of place together with some of the world's foremost experts in consumer applications. In our program, we don't aspire to create the next Mark Zuckerberg. We don't think that's necessary. But if some of our companies would be acquired for $10 million, that would be phenomenal. Well, we wouldn't decline if somebody came with more money, but $10 million is a lot of money. Everywhere. And in Ghana, it's a fortune. Say if Tress, say if Tress was acquired for $10 million. Esther, Cassandra, and Priscilla will be instant rock stars. They will be on radio and TV. They will be on front page of magazines and newspapers. They will be local role models. And as role models, they will inspire other youth to become software entrepreneurs as well. And our hope is that the program we develop can encourage people to become software entrepreneurs. Our hope is that the role models of our program will make the youth of Ghana and the youth of Africa realize the value of their talent in the same way I did when I was young myself. And this future event has not happened yet, but what I can say is that we are working very, very hard to make the future $10 million event a reality. And I'm confident that for every day that passes, we are coming one step closer. Future event number two, the first African software company is listed on NASDAQ. If we are able to create enough local role models, that will spur an amazing amount of innovation and job creation across Africa. You can see a lot of companies maybe try to solve problems they find locally in Africa. We will see a creation of a lot of companies maybe try to solve problems and globally. And as they grow and develop, they can make a huge impact. They can create jobs, they can create wealth, and they can create an impact in Africa and beyond. The future event number two takes place in the year 2026. It is the year where one of these local African software companies become big, and they get listed on NASDAQ. It is the most successful IPO of the year. It creates the first African tech billionaire, and it opens the world's eyes to the opportunity on the African continent. U.S. tech companies, Chinese tech companies, they all realize that the most attractive future growth for them lies within the growing population in Africa. And as a consequence, billions of dollars in investments is pouring into the African tech ecosystem. And as a consequence, 
millions of jobs are created. There are millions of people that become developers, millions of people that become data scientists, designers, and user interface experts. The tech industry in Africa over the, over the years eclipsed that of the natural resource industry, both in employment as well as exports. The future event number three is when my granddaughter graduates from college. And I have to say, I actually don't have any grandchildren yet. <laughs> I really hope I will be so fortunate one day. But when I do, and when my granddaughter graduates from college, I believe the world is completely changed. I believe the world has evolved to become very different than what it is today. I imagine my heart is beating a little faster as I see my granddaughter take the stage to receive the diploma, completing one of the most prestigious computer science programs in the world. I imagine I'm in Nigeria, and I imagine that my granddaughter becomes the graduate of the University of Lagos, the foremost computer science program in the world. Because the world has changed. Silicon Valley is, to th at this point, just one out of many innovation centers globally. There's a handful of them. And Lagos has ri risen as one of the most in innovative and fastest growing in the world, and being the engine of innovation across the African continent. My granddaughter graduates in a batch of a lot of international students because they come to Africa to get an upper hand in the future career development. Africa is the fastest growing economy, economy on the planet, and it's the most attractive place for developing your career. And at this point, Africa is the most sought after talent pool for software developers in the world. Those were my seven stories. Uh, some of you may think I'm overly optimistic. Some of you may think I'm dreaming. Some of me actually just think I'm just unrealistic. My counter will be this. The world's most valuable resource is talent. And talent is evenly distributed. It doesn't have a nationality, it doesn't have a zip code, and it's completely colorblind. The population growth in Africa is an amazing opportunity. At least I like to look at it that way. When my granddaughter graduates from college, there will be two billion people on the African continent. That's the highest concentration of raw talent in the world. If we can train and transfer commercial skills to this talent, that will have huge impact. If we can teach and transfer skills like development and data science to that talent pool, I believe that Africa could become a future tech superpower. The thought I will leave you with is this. I actually believe that Africa doesn't need aid. I don't think that Africa needs money. But what I think Africa needs more than anything is commercially valuable skills. Maybe you are an amazing designer. Maybe you're a diligent accountant. Maybe you're a creative marketeer. I believe if all of us focus on our core skills and transfer our core skills to those who need it, we can actually make an impact. That is why I believe in what I do. And that is why I became an accidental philanthropist. Thank you. Thank you.